Well, welcome to prayer meeting tonight. Our devotional thoughts come from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 12 through 20. 1 Corinthians 6, 12 through 20. And the title I put on these is Our Bodies Belong to Christ. You know, it's a shame that we have to speak of the things that follow in this lesson. Liberal humanistic thinking in our country dismisses out of hand the morality that was deeply embedded in American culture through its Christian heritage, particularly in the 1960s, beginning with the free love movement. We've seen the morals of this country decay exponentially. Now we look back at the pagans such as lived in Corinth and think of them as primitive and uncouth. But in truth, we have submerged ourselves in the same slime pit with them. And what is tragic is that most of the sexual perversion in our country is either now protected or condoned by law. And worse yet, a great percentage of people professing Christianity have gone along with this thinking. So it was a shame and reproach back there uh, when Paul wrote this letter to the church at Corinth. I mean, there was gross uh, sexually illicit things going on that even... You know, uh, some in the congregation were involved in, and Paul had to address it. And boy, I tell you what, it's worse today. But you just really don't hear a lot in the church addressing these things. So let's, let's see what the apostle has to say to us. Verse 12, the Bible says there, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but... I will not be brought under the power of any. That expression, all things are lawful for me. Notice Paul repeats it twice. Uh, and when you see something like that said in Scripture, it's there to call your attention to it. Pay attention. All things are lawful for me. This may have been a common saying among the citizens of Corinth that was intended to excuse their sinful actions. So I kind of see that Paul was maybe throwing their words back then. All things are lawful for me, right? Well, in this letter, Paul acknowledges Christian liberty, but not at the expense of our responsibility to God and the necessity for self-control. Sin is never lawful. Violating or ignoring God's standards is never lawful under any circumstance. And the tendency in doing these things that are not lawful is that those things you claim are liberty actually begin to control your life. In a sense, you become a slave to your liberty. How horrible is that? Verses 13 and 14, Paul says, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. Again, quoting, I think, uh, things that people were saying in Corinth and some things that had crept into the congregation there. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now, he's getting to his point. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Now, in our day, there is a perverse logic proposed by people professing to be Christian libertines. And this logic follows a, a downward path and while they believe it to be liberating, it actually brings them into opposition to God. And Paul states this logic in these words. Foods 
and the stomach were made for each other. Therefore, there can be no restrictions on what we can eat. The conclusion is eating is natural. Okay, you see a very humanistic and materialistic mindset here that some of these former pagans were bringing into the church and trying to make part of uh, Christian doctrine and the Christian experience. So the logic they're using is materialistic humanism. Foods in the stomach were made for each other. It's natural. So you can't have restrictions on what we can eat. You can't have restrictions on what is natural. So if eating is natural, then dietary regulations have no spiritual significance. Now, remember, under the law of Moses, there were dietary reg regulations. Uh, the Jews couldn't have breakfast. I mean, they couldn't have uh, bacon for breakfast in the morning. And they couldn't have uh, a ham dinner on Christmas. Well, they don't observe Christmas anyway. But, but you get my idea. And also, uh, they couldn't eat catfish. How many here like catfish? I don't particularly care for it, but they couldn't eat catfish. Why? Anybody know why? Huh? No. Huh? They didn't have scales. Couldn't eat. eat. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why I don't eat it. But uh, the, the law of Moses said you can't eat a fish that doesn't have scales. So, you know, there were, there were rules, dietary rules, that maybe people didn't understand why those rules existed, but simply God said that. So there was this attitude. Well, the early Christians were facing a lot of uh, false teaching on these things because there were Judaizing Christians that were trying to bring in the law of Moses into the Christian religion. And some of it was dietary regulations, okay? But there's a logic that is going on in this uh, Christian libertarianism that uh, is going further down the road than just eating. Their logic says, okay, based on that, as food and the stomach were made for each other, the logical conclusion is, so are the body and sexual activity. Well, makes sense, doesn't it? The body's bodies. We're males and females, blah, blah, blah. But their logic goes this way. Since the body is for this life only, right? Sexual restrictions have no spiritual value in this life. Sexual activity of any kind is outside the realm of morality. That was the logical conclusion of this humanistic philosophy. And this thinking is rampant in the United States of America today, even among some professing to be Christians. Sad to say. Well, Paul disagrees strongly with this thinking. I do as well. All sincere Christians do. He writes that the body is not for sexual immorality. Okay, immorality being the driving uh, statement there. And he says, instead, the body is for the Lord, just as the Lord is for the body. Our bodies are under the moral rule of God. This is a much higher standard than the world has for it. The proof of the standard Paul holds forth is the resurrection. Okay. As Christ was raised from the dead, so shall our bodies be raised from the dead. And what we did with those bodies, we will meet at the judgment. He goes on in verses 15 and 16. He asks us the question, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Think about that just for a moment. Your body, if you are a Christian, your body is supposed to be a member of Christ. 
okay? Like an arm is a member of your human body, okay? In a way, you are attached, part of Jesus Christ. So, you know, as Christians, we really need to remember that wherever we are, whatever we do, we are involving Christ in that as well. So he brings down the basic fundamental moral value here is do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? What's the obvious answer? No, absolutely no. And that's what he says. Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? And now he quotes scripture. For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So sexual immorality is a serious thing that people can be involved in. Number one, if you're Christian, it has no place in your life because your body is a member of Christ. And second of all, marriage is what God has sanctioned, and that's where that sexual relationship is supposed to live, the husband and wife, bringing together the family and so forth like that. And God specifically says that fornication and adultery are immoral. And in fact, under the law of Moses, adultery was a capital offense. You know what that means? Took it, they took the people out and stoned them to death. So, but we don't think about that in America anymore, do we? Adultery is accepted as normal and, and lauded. Adultery is uh, celebrated in our television programs. Carry on there. Well, here's a fact. If you are a Christian, your body is a member or part of Christ's body. Do not join his body to a harlot. Do not take part of Christ and join him to a prostitute or any illicit sexual activity. Okay? Don't just think of it in one sense. Uh, something that's really prevalent is pornography. Pornography. It's everywhere. Uh, if you have one of these things, you can view pornography. I'm not going to tell you how to do it, uh, but you can. If you have a computer, laptop, iPad, access to the Internet, you can find pornography. It's out there. It's easier to find than a lot of other stuff. You don't have to be too smart to find out where it is and how to get it. It's wrong. It is wrong with a capital R, wrong. Okay? So, it's uh, available at your corner uh, self-service store. Magazines and books and so forth like that. DVDs, videotapes and stuff like that. You can get it anywhere free. Okay, so pornography. Uh, in fact, you need to be careful of some of the TV shows that you watch. You know, you realize, oh my goodness, you know, there's some shows I just won't watch anymore because they're just too loose with it. You know, maybe they don't show what you could find in a porno magazine or something like that, but they get very close to it. Very close to it. And just something in me says, no, I, I, I just don't really want that in my house. I don't want that to be seen in my eyes because you know what? where that happens when you see it with your eyes? It gets registered in your head. You remember your head has all those pictures, all those words stored in there. Mm -hmm. So why fill your mind with stuff like that? The sexual union creates a one flesh relationship that is ordained by God in the creation. That's what Paul was referring to there. 
It's bad enough that the world despises God's plan and God's rule. But it is reprehensible for anyone professing to be a Christian to blaspheme Christ through the use of his or her body, which is Christ's body, in any illicit sexual activity. What is so sad? There seems to be no shame anymore. And where there is no shame, there is no respect for God. Nowadays, sexual activity is considered to be a normal part of dating. Mm -hmm. Normal, accepted. Engagement is accepted as a proper relationship for having children whatever engagement is. Used to be engagement was a promise uh, between a man and a woman to marry each other at a certain point in time. Not a, not a, 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 a permission to have children or anything else like that. And then many couples live their entire lives together without marriage without marriage. That is wrong. And you know, it's interesting, just a, a sign of our times and really the coming judgment of God. Uh, one of our fa favorite game shows on television is Wheel of Fortune. Anybody like that? I mean, it's a lot of fun, you know. Guess what those words are, you know, things like that. But you know, for the last several years, you get these people uh, coming on there and, uh, hello, uh, George, uh, are you married? Yes, I have a husband. Or, hi, uh, uh, Carol, how are you? Well, I have a wife, okay? Or, hi, uh, Sam, well, I, uh, I and Alice are in a relationship. Uh, we've been together for 17 years and we have X number of children. There's no shame anymore. Homosexuality living together without the benefit of marriage, having children like this, is accepted as normal. And you don't dare say anything against it. Okay? So, uh, you know, there is such a thing as common law marriage, but it's the wrong road to travel to obtain a legal and morally acceptable end. You know, it's not that hard to get married. You can go down to the courthouse and get married. If you know, uh, you stop by a church and uh, you know, ask the preacher if he, he or she would marry you. <clears throat> you know, one day, uh, sitting in my office, I got a call from a lady. And uh, she said, uh, my fiance is at Fort Sill uh, finishing up um, basic training. And I'm in Florida. My family's coming up to ceremony and said, would you, would you perform our, our marriage, for, our wedding for us? So we had a wedding right here in this church. It was one of the most exciting weddings I've ever been to <laughs> and uh, like that. So, you know, there, there's nothing to stop people from getting married legally. You know, I don't know what a marriage license costs. Uh, you know, that's one thing you have to do to go down to the courthouse, apply for a marriage license. It gets registered. You get married. The preacher signs off on it. You take it back to the courthouse and you live happily ever after for the next 50, 60, 70 years, right? You have children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And life is good if you do it God's way. But I promise you, if you don't do it God's way, your life will be miserable. You know, these living together arrangements. When people live together and they are sexually active, there is a bonding that takes place. And when something comes up and one of them says, hey, I found somebody else, I'm going away, that does emotional, uh, mental damage to a person. And, uh, you know, today, divorce. Uh, and that's one reason some people don't get married because, you know, they live together because, hey, everybody gets divorced, so why get married? Uh, it's hurtful, harmful, it's wrong. It hurts people. So, 
uh, verse 17, Paul says, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Again, pointing back to people professing to be Christians. You know, the world is doing its thing. It doesn't love God. It doesn't care about God's rules. But as Christians, we say we love the Lord and we are living out life the way that he intends us to live. He who is joined to the Lord, you Christians, is your one spirit with Christ. This is a basic fact about salvation. To be a Christian is to be united with Christ in spirit. How dare people subject the spirit of Christ to base unholy sexual immorality? Adam Clark remarks, who can change such a relationship for, con for communion with a harlot? Doesn't make sense. Or for any kind of sensual gratification. He who can must be far and deeply fallen. So Adam Clark is saying, somebody professing to be a Christian that can indulge in sexual immorality and any kind of sensual gratification like that must be deeply fallen. Not saved, but lost. Sad. Well, verse 18 through 20. Paul puts it down beautifully, simply, and understandably in three words. Flee sexual immorality. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Flee sexual immorality. Or as the Living Bible puts it, run from sex sin. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, don't you think? Why? Because this sin is different from all other sin. It's been said other vices may be conquered in fight, this only by flight. Run away from it. Sexual immorality is a sin that's committed against both God and our own bodies at the same time. First, it separates us from God by dismissing the Holy Spirit from our lives. So if you profess to be a Christian, you are saying that the Holy Spirit is living in you defying God by engaging in sexual immorality defiles the temple of the Holy Spirit so that he has to leave. Okay? So, it's committed against God, but it is committed against our own bodies. You see, sexual sin is addictive. More than any other form of sin, as it captures the appetites, the senses, and undermines and even destroys self-control. Um, if you've studied psychology to any degree, you find out that this is so true, that sexual immorality undermines uh, not just your personal morality, but... Uh, your self-control, uh, your thinking, your appetites. It's addictive. Um, you know, people that, that start looking at pornography, they get addicted to it, that uh, they, they just can't control themselves. Something just, you know, they don't want to do it, but yet they go get that book or they call up that website or whatever. You know, like an alcoholism, uncontrollable. person gets addicted to that alcohol and they, they, just, they don't want to drink, but they drink. Well, it's the same way with 
uh, sexual uh, uh, sin, uh, people committing adultery and stuff like that. It gets to be addictive. Why? You know, there's there's a thrill that your your body um, enjoys, and it begins to crave that thrill. Your mind begins to crave that thrill, and it draws you to it to whatever kind of illicit sex uh, activity you would be in, addicted to, and you just lose control. And it undermines other aspects of your person as well. You know, uh, anything that's addictive destroys life. Alcohol, cigarettes, sex, sexual sin, uh, you name it. Lying uh, can be addictive as well. So, as a Christian, your body is not your own. That's Paul's point. It belongs to God. He purchased your body with the death of Christ. So, we glorify God by surrendering both this body and our spirit to His complete control. Our bodies belong to Christ if we truly are Christians. So, be faithful to live out what the Word of God teaches us here. Be faithful to God. Be faithful to your own body. And be faithful to your relationships uh, in marriage. And if you're unmarried, be faithful to the relationship that you will have when you do get married. Preserve that. I know not as easy topic to talk about or listen to. But the Apostle Paul deals with it because it's something that troubled that congregation there in Corinth. And let me tell you what, I believe there are congregations in this community of ours that are troubled with some of these same things. And, you know, God wants us to teach on it. And God wants us to let people know that if you are trapped in this, if you are addicted in some way to this, there is deliverance. But I tell you what, you will have battles for the rest of your life. You will. Best not to start. But thank God you can be saved. You can be delivered. And you can have a life to where you don't have to go back to that at all. Thank God our bodies belong to Christ. Amen.